I too honour the first Australians, whose uh, people we celebrate, the cultures we honour, as the oldest continuing cultures in human history. Uh, Professor Mick Johnson, uh, to Dustin Mohammed, CEO of Reconciliation Australia. Uh, members of the board of the National Policy Fund, National Apology Foundation of Indigenous Australia, who are here with us this evening, uh, Pat Turner, Jackie Huggins, uh, Tim Goodwin, where are you Tim? And to all the distinguished guests uh, here present, seniors, friends, one and all. It's very difficult uh, all these years on to sit and to watch such a beautiful uh, rendition of Archie Roach's song. Um, and thank you very much for those who performed it. It was truly beautiful. Uh, they took the children. It is impossible to uh, sit in an audience and to hear that song performed without being moved to the core of your being. Impossible. And uh, I'm always taken by historical photographs. Whether it's in the Harvard Club in New York or CPO photographs of the indigenous people country, Australia, over the generations and over centuries now. To look into each of those faces of those small children and recognise that each of them is an extraordinary story. Each of them. They are not Aboriginal people, they are individual Aboriginal persons. And if you reflect for a moment on the pictures you saw, one of the earlier secret photographs in the series, is of that very tiny Aboriginal girl, perhaps three or four years old, a picture which looked at least a hundred years old. And simply the look in her eyes. Uncomprehending <clears throat> of the horror being inflicted or about to be inflicted on her. So if there is still any hardness of heart in this country, it's time we open our hearts afresh to look into the eyes and through the eyes to the deep soul of the tens of thousands of Indigenous Australians, the hundreds of thousands of Indigenous Australians over the centuries of European settlement whose lives were radically wounded. Seven years ago, I said to the Parliament of Australia that there comes a time in the history of nations that in order to embrace fully their future, they must fully reconcile with their past. Much has happened over the last seven years in our long journey of national reconciliation, much has not. And much, much more needs to be done. And as seven is a number of truly biblical significance, both in the biblical narratives of creation and destruction, perhaps it is time to reflect on our progress, our prospects, and perhaps our regress in this difficult but necessary journey we call reconciliation. We should begin by reminding ourselves why reconciliation is not optional for Australia, but necessary for our nation's future. We should reflect on countries around the world where the reconciliation of their peoples has not been achieved. I do not believe that we Australians want our children to grow up in divided societies. Divided societies do not happen by accident. They exist right around the world. 
They happen because political processes and economic forces allow them to happen. And the consequences are ugly. And as Australians, whatever our political affiliations, we are also challenged and I hope animated by a deep, inalienable, irreducible sense of justice. Justice, or whatever term we may use to describe it in the Australian vernacular, is embedded in our national DNA. It is this deep sense of justice that calls us to reconciliation, that calls us towards reconciliation, and that calls us towards completing reconciliation. Completing reconciliation. Reconciliation is not just a journey, it is a destination for Australia. If we were to deny ourselves the prospect of reconciliation, we would be denying these essential elements of our national spirit and character. We would also be denying the better angels of our human nature just as we would be failing to put to death some of the demons of our uncomfortable past in our dealings with Indigenous Australians. And as a people, we would not be complete. There is another reason why reconciliation is important, and it's a more practical one. Unless and until our processes of reconciliation draw towards completion and conclusion, as I believe they must, we are also failing to unleash the full human, economic and political potential of nearly half a million of our Indigenous brothers and sisters. That is a loss to the nation, it is a loss to Indigenous peoples themselves, it is a loss to us all. Reconciliation is easy to say. It is hard to do. It is also difficult as you said, to define. We seem to know what reconciliation is when we sense its absence. We don't seem to talk much about a reconciled society. This is worth thinking about more deeply. When we talk about reconciliation, are we therefore talking about a state of mind or a set of social attitudes? Are we talking about a framework of policy and law are we talking about measurable social and economic conditions? Of course, I believe we're talking about all of the above. The essence of reconciliation is the acceptance that a deep wrong has been committed by one person against another, by one group against another, or most disturbingly, by one race against another. Acceptance that a wrong has been committed is hard. Because of all the frailties of human nature, such acceptance can take a very long time. The world today is full of excuses as to why such wrongs were never seen as wrongs in the past, and why we should not have indulge ourselves in retrospective ethics. This leads to very dangerous ground indeed. Human pride is a profound and powerful emotion. Human pride, particularly embedded in entrenched historical narratives about one people's prejudices against another, can be lethal. If acceptance then is the first step in reconciliation, then an apology for past wrongs is the next. And of course, such an apology must be accepted. This again can be a hard thing to do. In the offering of an apology, if it is genuinely meant, weasel words are to be avoided. People are not stupid. Half measures can be spotted at a thousand paces. Escape clauses litter our political landscape. In our quest for reconciliation, we must be particularly mindful of the absolute simplicity of the biblical injunction of let your yes be yes and let your no be no. There is also the usual cautionary advice that we shouldn't be held responsible for the sins of our fathers. My response to this has long been that 
if we are willing to appropriate the positive dimensions of our heritage as the objects of contemporary pride, either personal or national, then it follows that we cannot behave as Pontius Pilate on the darker actions of our collective past. The acceptance of an apology for past wrongs is much harder than its rendering. An apology, after all, is in large part still a matter of words. For those who have been profoundly wronged, apologies can be seen as trivialising the depth of the damage and the hurt that has been done. Words, notwithstanding the obstacles constructed by our egos in actually articulating them, are, in the end, simple. But for reconciliation to be something more than words, an apology must be received as well. And if you have experienced the multiple indignities of Indigenous Australia over the decades and over the centuries, this is by far the harder road. There is a further step as well. Beyond the simple words of an apology, actions must be taken to bring about a level of restorative justice, either for the individuals who have been wronged, or in the case of Indigenous Australians, for Indigenous Australia as a whole. The National Apology, delivered seven years ago, was incomplete. Actions have to match our words, and that can mean, and must mean, putting your money where your mouth is. Some Indigenous leaders pointed to the time, and since then, to the absence of restorative payments to surviving members of the Stolen Generation. Separate to the National Program of Closing the Gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians <laughs> at large. There is merit in the criticism. During the last national elections, I undertook to revisit this if we returned to office. That proved not to be the case. There is, of course, a remaining part of our road to reconciliation, which is yet to be travelled at all. This lies in the process of formal political recognition of those who have been wronged and who should never have been wronged. In mourning the race-based murder of a group of African Americans at prayer at an Atlanta church early this year, <coughs> President Obama observed, recognition pre precedes justice. It is as if recognition, formal recognition, public recognition, political recognition, and in the context of the current Australian debate, constitutional recognition, completes a process which commenced with a much earlier societal acceptance that great wrongs had been committed. Reconciliation, particularly when it applies to the deeper sensitivities of race, is therefore the most difficult and at times the most volatile of processes. In reality, reconciliation is a complex of changing social attitudes, of emerging equalities, <laughs> and of policies and laws that both advance and in time recognise the same. In Australia, while we have made some progress along this path, there is still much distance and many obstacles that lie ahead. So what of reconciliation in Australia? It's a long, long time since the events of 1967. I remember clearly attending the commemorative and celebratory events of 2007 at Old Parliament House on the 50th anniversary of that landmark referendum. It was humbling to meet those who mobilised a nation at a time when racial stereotypes about our Indigenous brothers and sisters had changed little since the early years of European settlement. Remember, in 67, this was a time when the stolen generations were still being stolen. I also remember, perhaps my earliest political memory, walking into a polling booth with my father, a member of the country party, at the Amundi State Primary School in conservative rural Queensland in 1967, as he, to my surprise, my absolute surprise, voted yes. <coughs> or at least that's what he told me he did. <laughs> The truth is, much of the hard work on the road to reconciliation in this country has been done by those who have come before us. They deserve our admiration, each and every one of them. 
Australians, both black and white, who led, led the charge against the prevailing winds of searing prejudice. These were bare-knuckled days compared to the discourse in which we are now engaged. We should therefore honour the contributions of those who have brought us thus far. We should be humbled by them as we consider our current travails on constitutional recognition. The veterans of the 67 referendum, of the earliest land rights legislation, including Dunstan, Lingiari and Whitlam, of Keating and Redford, of Lowerture, then Marbo and Wick, and then the Bringing Them Home report on the stolen generations. So many people in this room have played a part in that. We all play our part, but we are all small in the wide sweep of history. We in Australia have indeed come a long way on this road less travel that we call reconciliation. At some point along this road, and it is difficult to identify when, we as an Australian people began to accept that a great wrong had been done to our Indigenous brothers and sisters. And that we, white folks, were responsible. It became absolutely impossible to ignore, to sweep discreetly under the carpet, even less to laugh off the conditions to which Aboriginal Australians had been reduced in the racist jokes that polluted our private and sometimes public conversations. We had, rightly, as Australians, become uncomfortable in the depths of our national conscience. We knew something had to be done without really knowing what to be done. With the work of the Bringing Them Home report, coupled with that of the National Sorry Day Committee, Reconciliation Australia as well, we began to realise that the time for formal national apology had come. I gave this undertaking to the Australian people in the 2007 election, and the apology became the first parliamentary act of my government. It is for the nation to judge what impact the apology has had on the deeper question of reconciliation over time. For me, the miracle of the apology was not that it was delivered. The miracle of the apology was that it was acknowledged, accepted, and I believe received by our Indigenous brothers and sisters. <laughs> Something, it seemed, had finally melted in the hearts of Australians, black and white. It was as if we were able to see one another through new eyes, or at least through a different lens. Compassion, at least for a season, replaced prejudice, mutual recrimination, and condemnation. Perhaps these were the tentative beginnings of deeper attitudinal change. As part of the apology, closing the gap was intended to deal with an entirely different dimension of any enduring reconciliation. It sought practical, funded, measurable programs to reduce and in time remove the structural disadvantages that divided Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. These focused on health, on education, on housing, and employment, and the appalling gap and the continuing obscenity in the gap in life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. These were not intended as noble aspirations. They articulated concrete goals within concrete timelines. They were anchored in funded programs reflected in Australia's first national agreement between the Commonwealth and the States on closing the gap signed in Darwin in December of 2008, and involving both government and non-government sectors. Most critically, the political parties committed to an annual report to the Parliament by the Prime Minister of the day on progress and any regress in achieving the policy objectives outlined in the Closing the Gap strategy. So far, we have had seven such reports. After seven years, the emerging picture is mixed with a number of measurable improvements in education, health, housing and employment, but with real problems in areas such as literacy and numeracy. The critical factor in all this is that we must have consistent, accurate data. I believe we now have the maturity as a national political community to confront the reality of Indigenous disadvantage rather than sweeping uncomfortable data under the carpet, or worse, ceasing to collect, collate or publish it. 
all future Australian governments should be held accountable against the policy objectives of closing the gap and the data which therefore keeps us honest. If the data tells us we are failing in particular areas, then let's have the imagination without political recrimination to do things differently. For the future of closing the gap, it should be a dynamic, not a static process. It should not be regarded as a closed canon. Since leaving office, I've recommended we add new measures concerning Indigenous access to higher education. I've also argued that we must now add new measures concerning Aboriginal incarceration rates around Australia, given the obscenity of the numbers we are now seeing. Earlier this year, on the anniversary of the apology, I spoke too of the dangers of creating a second stolen generation, arising from the alarming separation rates of Aboriginal children from their family and kinship groups, while fully recognising the alarming rates of domestic violence and child abuse. As a nation, we must not shrink from any of these challenges. <coughs> we must embrace them together, and with the great Australian characteristics of courage, of pragmatism and resolve. In our great mission of national reconciliation, the National Apology made a contribution. I believe it has helped change social attitudes. I believe it has produced some progress in reducing Indigenous disadvantage. But I also believe it is one part, but one part, of our greater effort to bend the arc of history. So what of constitutional recognition? The constitutional recognition of the first Australians is the next stage of our long national journey towards reconciliation. There has been a long national conversation on this over many, many years. It was among the key resolutions, for example, of the 2020 summit I convened within a month of the National Apology in 2008. It became then a core commitment of the newly elected government. The journey, therefore, on constitutional recognition has indeed been a long one. In fact, far too long. The importance of constitutional recognition lies in both simple concepts of respect and simple recognitions of reality. Respect for the unique status of this, the oldest continuing culture in our human family, whose continuity reaches back to deepest antiquity, connecting us to the indigenous mysteries of creation. Reality, because those of us who have come uninvited to this continent from various communities of the world to live and to have our being in this vast continent represent but a recent blip against the 50 millennia or more of continuing indigenous occupation. With the advantage of historical hindsight and contemporary reflection, there is a stunning arrogance in the language of our constitution. Of course, this was consistent with the age. We're all familiar with the doctrine of terra nullius, not to be overturned by the Australian courts for almost one century. But reflecting these grandly imperial assumptions of the age, our founding legal document saw indigenous peoples almost exclusively seen as a problem. Not as a people whose prior occupancy of terra australis incognita was in any way worthy of respect. Constitutional change must set these wrongs to right. Consistent with these changing realities, the formal repeal of the provisions of our constitution that are discriminatory in law and condescending in nature is essential. These do not belong in any civilized constitution of the 21st century. No other people within our Australian family least of all the first Australians, would or should tolerate the language of race in our founding covenant. This brings us to a further and more profound change, the scope of which lies beyond these legal realities. There is a sense, which we should not dismiss lightly, that by finally recognising Indigenous Australians in our shared constitution, and by removing its antiquated discriminations, we are also reflecting underlying changes in Australian social attitudes towards indigeneity, which in turn gives rise to further changes in an increasingly reconciled society. In my mind, the ultimate objective is to cause all Australians to have about them 
a spontaneous pride in Indigenous Australians. That has not been the case so far. It is, however, now <coughs> becoming the case. We see this already in the national and international prestige attached to Indigenous art, design and dance. I believe this appreciation will progressively deepen and broaden to new areas of Indigenous creativity, professional engagement and enterprise. This trend sits comfortably with, and in my view is furthered by, the impending reality, we hope, called constitutional recognition. I'm aware, painfully aware, of the content, complexity and texture of the current discussion within Indigenous Australia and between Indigenous Australians and the rest of the Australian community on the desired content of the constitutional amendments to be put to the Australian people. Hard questions have been raised, and harsh things have, from time to time, been said. I'm aware of the discussion over preambular paragraphs versus explicit Indigenous recognition at the beginning of the Constitution proper. These phrases should, in my view, reflect the fact of our indelible Indigenous heritage, that this is a living heritage, and therefore an equally indelible part of our common Australian future. And given the findings of our courts in recent decades, these acknowledgements should also include the enduring connection between Indigenous Australians and the land and waters of our shared continent. The poetry of these phrases should also be memorable, not drafted by a bloody committee, so that these too become etched in the minds and souls of all Australians for the future, a document of which we can be proud. The debate over the repeal of Section 25 of the Constitution on the potential exclusion of people from electoral participation on the grounds of race is clear-cut and uncontested. Section 25 must be repealed. Section 25 provides that if by the law of any state or persons or any race are disqualified from voting in elections for the more numerous House of, House of Parliament of the state, then in reckoning the number of the people of the state or of the Commonwealth persons of that race resident in that state shall not be counted. I'll read that again if you like. <laughs> it is self-evident that Section 25 must go. The other explicit reference to race in the Constitution is in Section 5126. This empowers the Commonwealth to make laws for the people of any race for whom it is deemed necessary to make special laws, unquote. The debate here is how to amend this provision in a manner that preserves the Commonwealth's power to legislate the specific purposes of Indigenous Australia and to their advantage, without explicit recourse to a race power. But then follows the equally contentious debate over the inclusion or otherwise of a new and explicit constitutional provision that would effectively import the re relevant provisions of the Racial Discrimination Act of 1975 into the Constitution proper. This would, in the argument of its proponents, prevent any future Parliament from legislating in a manner injurious to the interests of Indigenous Australia. There was even further debate over the desirability of an Indigenous advisory body to advise future governments and parliaments on the impact of proposed legislation on the interests of Indigenous Australians, and if so, whether such an advisory body should be anchored in the Constitution or in legislation. I do not believe it is productive for me to engage in the debate over these most contentious questions of constitutional reform. That, in my view, is probably the province of Indigenous Australia. And their engagement in turn with the Australian political process. I am happily no longer part of that process. But I would, mindful of my direct experience in the preparation of the national apology, caution against the rigidities of a debate that sees the perfect triumph over the good, only to see the perfect defeated and the good defeated and the potential political ugliness of a divisive referendum. In 2008, the government consulted widely on the content of the apology. I received conflicting advice from all across the government and beyond. In the end, I made a call and wrote it myself. Quite efficient. The apology was far from perfect but we did manage to carry the nation with us. 
We also, in an even greater miracle, were able to carry with us Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Had we failed to do so, the apology and all that came as a consequence of it, along the long and torturous road to reconciliation, including the practical measures contained in closing the gap, would have been rendered null and void with the inevitable twists and turns of the political cycle. <clears throat> The degree of political difficulty with the referendum to amend the Constitution is much greater. The vicissitudes of the House, in which the government commands a majority, is little compared with the vicissitudes of public opinion, if and when a politically effective no case is mounted, irrespective of whether it is formally endorsed by one political party or another. The race demon has not yet been fully exercised or expunged from our national soul. All this is by way of saying that obtaining bipartisan political support is essential to see constitutional change through the hazardous waters of a referendum. The failure to obtain such support would most likely result in the proposal for a referendum dying before it was actually put to the people. Or if it was, we would run the greater risk of a divisive national debate on race, which would deeply scar the as yet fragile tissue we have in Australia in this living process we call reconciliation. Imagine too the reaction around the world we went to the people on a divided or at least divisive proposition which saw the proposition voted down. The world would conclude that the ghosts of white Australia had somehow returned in a different form. <coughs> we should be cautious about any such risk given how far we have come so far. I respect the views of my Indigenous brothers and sisters who warn against constitutional nominalism, the trivialization of symbols, and the triumph of symbols over substance. I therefore do not argue for a minimalist approach. I believe the new Prime Minister has an open mind on these questions, and unless I am proven to be wrong, has a deep empathy for Indigenous Australians. Furthermore, the previous Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition have also sought to improve consensus in the recent roundtable they convened at Kirribilli. What I argue for myself is for the most expansive consensus possible to be forged among Indigenous Australians and between them and the Australian political process. And, most critically, while the national climate is still right, to get on with it and to do it. I genuinely fear the loss of national political momentum on constitutional recognition. The Australian public want it. Let us not degenerate into a public bug fight. And let's remember that an agreed form of constitutional recognition provides a better starting point for ultimate justice <coughs> than the present constitutional silence. Even what some might call symbolic constitutional change can usher in a further era of substantive policy change, changing the way we do business when governments and parliaments come to consider the distinctive needs and entitlements of Indigenous Australians in the future. There is a sense that each stage of this reconciliation process <coughs> builds on the previous. It creates momentum and it's capable of further renewing momentum. There will be an election next year both sides of politics will commit to constitutional recognition. A constitutional convention will then need to be convened. And 2017 is not far away. We should be very wary of the risks of political dissipation as other priorities emerge, or as the political process concludes that consensus on recognition is deemed too politically difficult or simply impossible. We should remember what one writer has said of such circumstances that a tide in the affairs of men, when taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea, we are now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or lose our ventures. Let us not miss this tide. Let us grasp this opportunity to take this difficult national journey of reconciliation with the first Australians to the next stage. And let us, just for a moment, lift up our eyes 
from the trenches of political battle and gaze for a moment upon the mountains, unleashing for a moment our imagination on the new possibilities that might just lie beyond constitutional recognition towards an Australia that is utterly, wonderfully, magnificently, racially blind, colour blind. Where Australians are indeed judged not by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. That, I believe, is the Australia we desire in all our hearts. Reconciliation has indeed been a long journey for this nation of ours, Australia. For Indigenous Australians, this journey has been the longest of all. It is a journey in which we all have a stake in which we all have a responsibility as women and men of goodwill, and in which we all have our part to play, be it large or small. Mine has been the apology. It has also been with closing the gap. And of course I stand ready to do more, as I've long believed it is right to stand on the side of Indigenous Australia, to be in their corner, rather than to have them stand alone. To this end, I have established the National Apology Foundation for Indigenous Australians. And as we speak, I'm advised, the Parliament is this week passing legislation to afford this foundation, the National Apology Foundation for Indigenous Australians, DGR status, for which I'm thankful to the previous Treasurer and his successor. The Foundation has as its aim perpetuating the spirit the objects and the substance of the apology. <coughs> the Board of the National Apology Foundation has agreed that one of its major priorities over time is to raise an endowment for a permanent chair here at the Australian National University dedicated to the explicit analysis of the policies necessary for and the core data associated with closing the gap. To be blunt, whoever the future government of Australia happens to be, we want to keep the bastards honest. We want to ensure the necessary data is collected to measure our success or our failure in bridging the intergenerational gap of entrenched Indigenous disadvantage. This mission must continue beyond the passing seasons we call politics. The Chancellor of the University, a quiet man, you may know him, <laughs> tells me such a chair will need a $5 million endowment. I'm tempted to say, to paraphrase, paraphrase the great work of Australian cinematography and the array of philosophers portrayed within it, that they've got to be dreaming. <laughs> we will talk about the numbers and, of course, the university's own contribution. Won't we, Mick? <laughs> Today, however, I wish to announce I'll be making an initial personal contribution of $100,000 to the Foundation to begin its fundraising campaign now. <laughs> As the song says, from little things, big things grow. It's also far easier in my experience to eyeball somebody and ask them for money when you've stuck your hand in your own pocket. <laughs> Indigenous reconciliation is a challenge not for, just for Australia. It is a challenge for the 350 million Indigenous peoples of the world and the settler communities and countries in which they live. The indigenous peoples around the world are among the most poor and oppressed. As in Australia throughout history, they too have been pushed to the margins. The sad reality is that many countries have simply given up on the universal moral challenge of reconciling with their indigenous peoples. Sometimes this is the product of indifference, sometimes it's a question of political inconvenience. In others, it's a question of what I would sense is learned helplessness. That because Indigenous advantage, disadvantage, has become so entrenched, simply nothing works. There are elements of all these in the countries I've looked at around the world. That we in Australia yield to none of these. That we in Australia instead, as we attend to our own real challenges, in achieving the reconciliation in our own land, encourage others also around the world to do the same. And so too, together, 
indeed bend the arc of history. I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, if you're not stimulated about uh, reconciliation and constitutional recognition uh, before this lecture, you ought to be now. Um, Mr Rudd uh, has kindly um, agreed to take some questions. So if you've got a question, um, put up your hand, wait for your microphone. And please um, be um, reminded of uh, uh, the nature of the event and the need to be um, respectful. Uh, someone will be marching around. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, over here. I, I was just a little surprised land rights didn't play a part in your description of reconciliation. What I said was that um, uh, land rights was uh, part of uh, the process. I referred uh, directly to, uh, to Whitlam, to Lingiari, to Dunstan, that whole period, to Mabo and to Wick. What I say is that reconciliation, in fact, from the earliest times when the national conscience was disturbed, around the time of 67, I think, uh, through until the present, has seen one wave after the another of engagement uh, with bringing some justice to Indigenous peoples. And land rights, frankly, was at its core. I mean, I follow those processes quite keenly, which is why I was keen to mention Mabo and Wick and those who did the earlier legislative efforts on those questions as well. My further point, though, about um, reconciliation is what I sense from Indigenous Australia is there's kind of a sense of both outrage and exhaustion, as I speak to my own Indigenous friends, about when it is we're going to finally put all this stuff to bed, the whole business of reconciliation, and get on with it. Get on with the national future together. It ain't rocket science when you think about it. Social attitudes are hard to change, I give you that. But it ain't rocket science to get on with the core bits which make up the full jigsaw puzzle. Sometimes what I despair about, as someone who's engaged in this, as a white fellow, who was for a while Prime Minister, uh, is that when I hear the language that reconciliation is a process, reconciliation is a journey, um, I become very impatient for my Indigenous brothers and sisters. Reconciliation is a destination. Reconciliation is where we want to be as a nation. Reconciliation is the character of the society we wish to be, a fully reconciled Australia. And if we think that's illusory, then we're defeated from the first step. So we start to need to, lead, uh, to unleash our national imagination as to what a reconciled Australia actually looks like. I think we can do that. We need to start painting a picture of what it could and should be. Not in just a bunch of numbers and flowery words, but what the hell would it be? by Indigenous peoples are fully empowered and fully particip participating in every element of Australian society. But when I look at an Indigenous person, I no longer see any element of colour, I just see another human being. I think that's a conversation we need to start in order to get people to say, well, let's, let's get to that and get through these apparently sort of impossible steps on the way. This requires political imagination, it requires national imagination, but it's dual. What I'm encouraged by is the attitude of my kids' generation, and all my kids have grown up in Queensland, People's Republic of Queensland. <laughs> Which, over the years, has been a little conservative from time to time. <laughs> try, try being the Labour Prime Minister of Queensland. <laughs> yeah, a few degrees of difficulty there. But anyway, the, um, what I'm encouraged by when I meet these kids is that I find in my kids and all of their 
generation of kids, a group who are genuinely colorblind and race blind. Now, I cannot say at university about all kids in the country. I can't. But you know, there's something of a trend here. And our job is to turn that unfolding social reality into a broader picture which says, that's the Australia we're going to be. Um, <clears throat> if we think it's hopeless, and frankly, everything else we do in the meantime becomes mechanical and almost something that you've got to do. I'm all for imagining the future as it can be and then get them there. That's what I'm about. Land rights are part of it. Hi, my name is Sarah Burke. Um, Where are you from, Sarah Burke? I'm from Canberra, actually. Yeah, the PhD student. Oh, good. Okay, what are you studying? I'm looking at Indigenous health and well-being okay. in Canberra. Um, what I wanted to address was your point about being held blind. Cool. Um, I was hoping when you were saying that you want an Australia that is a wonderful, beautiful place. I was hoping your next work was going to be diverse, but it was colorblind. And I think I when you... Can I just interrupt? I wouldn't juxtapose the two. Well... The diversity, in my judgment, is kind of inherent in the proposition. Colorblind my... means that, in, in my sense, and maybe this is Queensland dialect, <laughs> that you simply enjoy the diversity is there and you're utterly unmindful of the fact that this person should be considered inherently different to you. That's what I mean. I understand what you're saying, but I think also raising a generation of people who are colorblind ignores the lived reality of people of color who do experience discrimination on that basis, whether or not their friends or family are colorblind. Yeah, no, I'd like to hear from our Indigenous brothers and sisters on that. I mean, having grown up in a community where we had one Indigenous family, um, and I've had direct experience of what they had on the receiving end of that, and that was quite a while ago. Sorry, I, I just... just interrupt and say you have heard from Indigenous sister. Sorry? Have you have heard from an Aboriginal sister? I didn't quite get you. I am Aboriginal? Yeah. And I made that comment to you as an Aboriginal person. You know. Sure, but I'm not disputing that. All I'm saying is I think we're having a discussion about a different interpretation of words. When you say diversity, I say yes and amen. We're from different parts of the world. When I say colorblind, what I mean is that people are not actually um, alienated by the sight of somebody who comes from somewhere different. And they actually turn around and celebrate the diversity with them. That's what I mean. So maybe it's a question of language. But I don't think there's anything fundamental to separate. Okay, thank you. Good. Perhaps take two more questions. This one and that one over here. Mr. Bell, thank you very much for your um, excellent presentation. My question is about uh, the, the proposed National Human Rights Act that Father Frank Brennan, one of the long champions of human rights and the rights of Indigenous Australians, the former government abandoned the proposal for a National Statutory Bill of Rights. Queensland is currently having an inquiry. Um, as an advocate of reconciliation, are you fully supportive of a Bill of Rights for Queensland? Well, as you know, there's a difference between common and state statutes in this area. By the way, my defence in response to all sorts of questions is that I'm adding many things, but I'm not a lawyer. So um, I will defer partly on those questions. But the reason that uh, I, among others, including then Attorney General, invited uh, Frank Brennan to um, uh, chair that committee and do the drafting that he did on the desirability of a Human Rights Act for Australia was to advance the debate in very concrete terms. What would it look like? How would you go about doing it? What would be the questions that you'd put to people as you propose that change? Um, and I think that is still um, valuable work. Why I intrinsically, as a matter of principle, have long supported bills of rights is as follows. We cannot assume that the current societal assumptions about what is acceptable and unacceptable based on common law traditions will pertain in 50 or 100 years' time. That's what worries me. And therefore, the, abil the ability to return always to a founding covenant 
which makes explicit constitutionally what those rights are, is by far the desired course of action. Knowing something about how people campaign negatively in this country when you propose a radical change such as this, I think the first step is actually to put all the relevant issues on the table, and Frank's report did that very well. So in direct response to your question about Queensland, which as you know, as a state, involves a different set of considerations, of course, I fully support that. Last question, what's this fellow kept on? He's not to me. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Rudd. My name is David Rudd. I'd like to take up the statement you made about not rewriting the Constitution by committee, and I certainly agree with your observation about committee aesthetics. My question is, do we have the talent as a nation to rewrite the Constitution? Well, remember when we're talking about constitutional recognition, we're not taking the document apart in total, we're talking about the subtraction and addition of clauses. And so, let me pose a question to you all. <coughs> Render to me one memorable phrase in our existing Constitution. <laughs> You've got one? Yeah. Any lawyers here? Constitutional lawyers? You got one? Yeah, I'm, I rest my case. <laughs> there just ain't nothing there. <laughs> Most of us can quote bits of the Bill of Rights, some of us can quote parts of the Declaration of Independence, the United States, etc. We've had a poverty of national poetry. Now, poetry doesn't solve all problems, they must be grounded in fact and in the conclusions you make in policy about what the change is to be. But it is not beyond our national wit and wisdom and creativity, particularly from our indigenous brothers and sisters, to come forward with language which frankly <coughs> enlivens the soul and becomes part of the national poetry of the country. I think that's part of what we're looking for. Do we have such people? Well, this room's full of bright people. Far brighter than me when it comes to creative, uh, creative work. So yes, I'm sure there are folks around. So what I'm saying in that cryptic remark was that let's get the policy right. I've outlined the four or five, or maybe even two or three, contentious policy questions which currently inform the constitutional debate on constitutional recognition. Uh, let's get that done quickly so we can get on with the business of getting it done. And then having done so, ensure that what we craft is not the usual turgid bureaucraties of which we, the political class, are famous <coughs> across the world. So, yes, there's smart people around. Thank you. Uh, that concludes uh, the gentleman question and answer session.